is the Lord responds to what we're doing. So the Lord, the Lord responds, right? The Bible says, draw close to God and he will draw close to you. And here's the thing. Some of you heard me say this before, like, how could the Holy Spirit live inside of you? And you need to draw close to him. Because the thing is that that's an interesting idea, right? The Holy Spirit, for those that are born again, lives inside of us. And yet that command is in the New Testament speaking to us to draw close to God. Why would those that have God living inside of them need to draw close to God? Because, because just because uh, you are in a temple doesn't mean you're worshiping, right? Um, just because the thing is that you choose what you posture or direct your heart to. So G Jesus gave you the advantage. You have the advantage. You have a fighting chance, right? He sealed you with the Holy Spirit for those that are born again. And, and that means that your spirit is born again. But remember that the Bible says to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? I believe it's in Galatians. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Again, why do you continuously need to be filled? We see this also in John chapter 4, where Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, I'm going to give you a fountain of living water springing up into everlasting life. Like, so basically he's saying this is it's a fountain that's going to have to it's going to continue to spring up you know until you're with me right so and why do do we need that and obviously there's various reasons but when the bible says be filled with the holy spirit it means that the holy spirit is in your spirit but you choose what you fill your soul with so that when you're filled with the holy spirit it's when the holy spirit permeates your mind permeates your emotions because you are choosing to surrender your mind and your emotions to him. So even though he lives in you, you have to make a decision. In other words, this is what God did. He said, I'm going to put myself in you so that I can give you the power to put yourself in me. I'm going to put myself in you so that I can give you the power for you to put yourself in me. And then some would say, but that doesn't make sense because if he's in you, you're in him right away. And yes, in a sense, when it comes to salvation, but that doesn't mean that your intentions, it doesn't mean your thoughts, it doesn't mean your feelings, it doesn't mean your perspective is in him, right? And so that, this is why the Bible says, right, there is no con condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh, Romans chapter eight, because, because being in Christ is actually being under the influence of Christ. It's being, it's being in the mind of Christ, right? You guys follow me? It's seeing things the way Christ sees things. I don't know if you guys understand. So, so the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. So you have the mind of Christ, but that doesn't mean that you're choosing to think in the mind of Christ. That's not, that doesn't mean that you're choosing. Do you understand what I mean by that? So basically what, what I'm being reminded of is that, is that, is that we are waiting on this, on this, how do I say this? The impossible aspect of your calling can only come from God and he is waiting to pour it out. But see, emphasis on the word waiting, it's, it isn't always his timing. Sometimes it's, it's your willingness. And I'm gonna, we're, gonna get, we're gonna get into the scripture. There are supernatural things that God wants you living right now. There are miraculous things. Let me just say this, if you're bored, if you're bored, you're not 100% in the will of God. I didn't say if, every, if, you're, if everything is perfect. But let me tell you something. When you're 100% in the will of God, you're never going to be bored. There's just no way. <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit is the creator of all life. So there's going to be life flowing. So if you're, if you're bored, it's because you've been natural. And this, this applies to me. It applies to everyone, right? This is, this is an invitation. This isn't condemnation. It's provocation, invitation, inspiration, motivation, right? It's not condemnation. So what happens is, is the Lord is reminding us that he has done his part. He has done his part. He has done the impossible, right? He has done the impossible. And so I want to I wanna share um, some scripture on this, right? And, and le let me just start with um, uh, Matthew, uh, the book of Matthew. Well, yeah, the book of Matthew. Um, and, and I'm going to just read this. So some of you know, right, when Jesus died on the cross, there was an earthquake, right? You, you guys know this. There was an earthquake, right? And so when Jesus died on the cross, there was an earthquake. The earth shook. And so I'm going to read it to you. Um, an earthquake 
coincided with the crucifixion. And when, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the, of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open. Wild. So right there, you have to understand something. That right there, right there, you are going to see, you are going to see right there that that is the purpose. That is the purpose of, 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 of what, 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 am, what am I saying? Right after the crucifixion, you see the fruit of the crucifixion. <laughs> In other words, right after the crucifixion, you see what happens, that it says he gave up his spirit, right? His spirit didn't leave his body. It doesn't say, you know, like when someone dies, their spirit left their body. It doesn't say his spirit left his body. His spirit didn't leave his body. He gave up his spirit, right? He said that. No one takes my life. I lay it down and I pick it back up again. No one takes my life. I lay it down. So he gave up his spirit. And then Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in, 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 into from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs were open. There you go. The tombs were open. What are the tombs? Well, the tombs are the righteous meaning Abraham, David, Elijah, uh, uh, well, Elijah went up in a, in a chariot, but David, uh, uh, you know, all the Old Testament, right, the Old Covenant, they went to Abraham's bosom, right? You guys know that. They went to paradise. Um, they, they didn't go to heaven at that time because you could not go to heaven with any sin. So they were forgiven. They were righteous. So they went to paradise. This is all in the Bible for those that don't know, right? They went to Abraham's bosom, right? And so, so Jesus dies on the cross and then the tombs are, are broken open. So it's, it's safe to say that the earth shaking uh, was connected to all those tombs breaking open, right? Like all these spirits coming back, uh, 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 you know, and I believe the earth shook in general because the blood of the creator hit the earth. So, you know, and then the, the tombs shook and all these men, all these men are, and women, right? Deborah, Esther, all these men and women that had served God. It doesn't say by name, but it's safe to say they were resurrected in that moment. And why? Because the whole point was now that Jesus defeated sin, everyone goes to everyone can go to heaven. Right? Because remember that when 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 there was a war in heaven, uh, Lucifer was casted out. And I and, and I believe that's why God created one of the reasons God created the garden, so that this does not happen in heaven again. So boom, everyone, you know, I believe everyone everyone that were there 40 days and 40 nights, the same way Jesus was. The the temple was torn in two. Now, the temple. Is is I mean the, the 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 where the where the the curtain was was the most holy place. Anyone that goes in there would drop dead instantly. Anyone that walks into the most holy place drops dead instantly. Remember that God said, "No one will see, no flesh shall, shall see God and live." Now, key word it says flesh, not spirit, because you could see God in your spirit, and that's how we see Him, right? So, but He says, "No flesh shall shall see God and live." So even the priests would drop dead when they had sin. So even the priests, the only ones that could go into the most holy place were the priests, the Levites, and even they would drop dead if they had sin. So when they didn't have sin, they would be able to go give the sacrifices, whatever, whatever. Now, Jesus dies on the cross. He tears the veil from top to bottom. And what does that mean? It means now everyone can walk into the most holy place. It means this is why the Bible says we are a, we are a royal priesthood a holy nation so now everyone that's born again is more holy than those priests and it and has access to his presence in fact the presence went into you so that that is the point that you have access so and this is and and this is why in 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 ephesians chapter 1 right verse 15 to 23 apostle paul says i pray i pray to the father that you would have the spirit of revelation that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you would know the riches and the glory and the inheritance that is in the saints so right and it says and the power that raised christ from the dead above every principality and power and ruler and high place and seated him at the right hand of the father what's crazy about this is he's talking to the church uh, uh apostle paul is talking to the church and he's basically saying, I'm praying so that you would know what you have. I am praying so that you would know what you have. So basically, today, we are. I'm praying that we would know what we have. <laughs> you know, I'm praying we would know what we have because when we know what we have and the more we know what we carry, the more we understand that we are never defeated. The more we understand that if we're still fighting, we're actually winning. 
the more we, because why? Because fighting the good fight of faith isn't a battle of a back and forth. Fighting the good fight of faith is choosing to crucify your flesh by faith and access the victory. It isn't trying to achieve a victory. Does anybody follow me? Fighting the good fight of faith is not trying to achieve a victory. It's accessing a victory. It's walking in a victory. It's, 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 it's experiencing, experiencing the victory. Does anyone understand what I'm saying or no? So basically, the Lord is waiting for us. He's waiting for us. And I'm going to read, I want to read Matthew chapter 8, verse 25 to 27. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. So this is like where, where they were in the boat, right? And the storm came. They were like trying to get to the other side and the storm came. And so they, Jesus, Jesus is asleep, right? And they go and they wake him up because there's a storm. And I imagine that their boat was little. They didn't have motors at that time. There was no way to imagine. You don't have a motor. They, I don't even know if they had sails. They probably just had uh, oars. They didn't have a sailboat. Excuse me. They didn't have motors. So if a storm comes, naturally speaking, that's you're subject to the storm because a motor cannot race you out of it. I mean, even with a motor, a storm in the ocean is dangerous. So imagine. But what happens is naturally speaking, if you don't have a motor, if you don't have, you know, you're you're pretty much out of gas, right? So I actually experienced this with Erica when we were, we took a, a we paid a, a fisherman uh, some money to to take us on a little small fishing boat from mainland Puerto Rico to the little island called Culebra which is an hour away. And while we're there, there's this huge storm that starts coming, you know? And, and I started laughing and stuff. And then the other people that were there we, we got mad at me. But hey, I, you know, you know, I, I had faith, you know, I had faith, right? So, and anyway, so what happens is Jesus was 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 asleep because to him there's no need for him to remove the storm. And this is this is what happens with us. Our faith is in God removing the trial. Our faith is in God removing the pro is in God removing the problem. We want God to remove the problem. We want God to remove the Judas. We want God to remove the, 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 the people that are betraying us. We want God to remove the situation and the circumstance. We that's, that's our, our faith. That's 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 immature faith, right? But Jesus understands that it's 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 that very thing that is going to validate your authority. It's that very thing that is going to validate what the father wants to do. It's that very thing that is going to build, build you. It's that thing that is going to take you. It's going to graduate you. It's going to promote you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, but the thing is that, you know, that college, when college is difficult and you, and if you want to be a doctor, you got to do eight years, nine years. I don't know. You're, you're willing to deal with it. Why are you willing to deal with, with nine years of college, potentially eight years of college, potentially the reason that you're willing to deal with it is because you know the reward. You know doctors. You know how much they make. You can see the outcome. You know the outcome. The reason why a lot of times we cry bloody murder in the, in the middle of the trial is because you cannot see the outcome. You cannot see the outcome. God, even though God gave you a prophetic word, he gave you a prophetic dream. He gave you a conviction. He gave you a vision. He brought, he, he brought two or three people to prophetically confirm it to you. You know that you know that God said he was going to get you to the other side. But what happens is, what happens is you, you, you don't see the result. You don't see the reward. So you're, you're tempted in that moment to think with natural eyes, not understanding that God is using that very thing to validate you. You, you want me to prove it to you with scripture? What did, what did God tell Thomas? You believe because you have seen, but blessed, blessed are those that have not seen, but believe. What does that mean? That means when they, when you choose to believe without knowing the reward that you're going to get, you're letting God be God. You're letting him define the reward. And it makes you having the reward uh, 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 legitimate. It makes, it legitimizes. And, and when, when, when you believe without seeing, Satan cannot come and steal it because you pass the test. It legitimizes God actually giving you what he wanted to give you. But if you run away from the trial and you run away from the circumstance, then God cannot legitimize the reward. And then you end up saying like them, what did they say? Lord, we're dying. We're dying. There's another translation that says, don't you care that we're dying? And that's how we are when we don't have faith. And we're going to break this down a little bit. That's how we are when we don't have faith. We think that it's because God doesn't care when he cares more than you. You have to understand something. God is responding to each and every one of our thoughts. 
if we are unaware that God is responding to each and every one of our thoughts, it's a testament to our insensitivity, not his. I want you to understand that. I know that, that, that that's, that, that's a lot to swallow. If the, doesn't the Bible say that he counts every, every hair on our head? You know that everybody hair falls out of your head every day. So that means that God is counting the, the hairs on your head every day. Why would he care about such a thing? It, it's, it's showing you that God cares about things that you don't care about. But what happens is, what happens is we're not going to, we're going to think that because we are not choosing to have faith. Now, I'm going to get into the inner mechanics of, inner mechanics of this. This is not just a, a, a preaching of you need to have more faith. This is the beauty of, 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 of Christ. This is the beauty of the word of God. He always gets into inner mechanics. He always explains, by the way, I'm not going to get deep into this. I'm not going to go off on a tangent. Christianity is the only religion that does that. FYI. He's the only one that calls you his sons and his daughters. Other religions do not do that. And he's the only one that explains himself to you. Other religions say you're not going to get an explanation. It actually says things like that. So just understand how good he is. So anyway, so Matthew, Matthew 8, 25, I'm going to, I'm going to keep reading. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. But he said to them, you, 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 um, why are you fearful? Oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. So the men marveled saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Interesting. So the men said, who can this be that even the, the winds obey him? I want you to pay attention to this. We're going to read it right now. That one of the things that Jesus will repeat to them is how long do I have to be with you? How long do I have to be with you? Oh, you of little faith, how long do I have to be with you? Why would he say that? We're going to read it right now, right? Why would he say that? And then he would say, oh, you of little faith. Remember, they're like, who could this be that the winds and the sea listen to him? Wow. Because you were close to him, enough for you to wake him up, you got to see his authority. Because you got to see his authority, now you have more faith in his authority. So maybe that is what he means when he says, how long do I have to be with you? Not, why haven't you accepted what I have said blindly, without question? Not as much that. More, why is it you have not taken advantage of me being with you. See, he was sleeping and they woke him up because they had a problem. Why weren't they, why, why was he able to go sleep? Why weren't they talking to him, asking him questions, learning from him instead of allowing him to go sleep and you only wake him up when there's a crisis? That's what happens with us. Because we only wait for a crisis, we don't have faith to overcome, to laugh at the crisis when it comes. We don't have faith to tell the crisis to speak to the storm. We, we're, we're holding on on a wing and a prayer, which prayer is powerful, but I'm using the phrase. We're holding on for dear life that we get through the trial. We get through the storm because we weren't taking advantage of getting close to God who tore the most holy place. That there are actually people in the old covenant that dropped dead because they, they had sin and they couldn't go in there. And they, they would have wished that they could have what we have. He tore the curtain, put his power in you, made you the Ark of the Covenant. He made you the Ark of the Covenant. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He made you the Ark of the Covenant. And then, and then we are there holding on for dear life because we weren't seeking him when there was no crisis. We weren't pulling from him when there was no trial. And because of that, in other words, Jesus was basically saying, you should be looking like me and sounding like me, not, not complaining to me. And don't understand, don't misunderstand me. There is such a thing as holy complaining. If, if you're going to gossip with anyone, gossip to the Lord. You know, it's all, you know, don't misunderstand me. There is such a thing, right? I mean, we see it in the book of Psalms. I mean, homie was always complaining. King David was always complaining. And that... And there's a holy aspect to that, right? Because, you know, if you're a weakling, a, com a complainer, 
uh, uh, terrified, scared, whooped, you know, with the Lord in intimacy, then you're giving him your weakness. And, and the Bible in Hebrews 11 says, out of weakness, they were made strong. So, uh, so when, you, when you're able to do that, there's a transformation that happens, right? Transformation happens when we're transparent. So transformation does not happen without transparency. It's when we're transparent that 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 he can he can parent. <laughs> you know what I mean? We let him we let him father us, right? So I'm going to read Matthew 17. So basically, what am I saying? This is a mystery, and I want you to say that to yourself so that you could. This is a mystery that I believe the Lord wants to solve. He wants to resolve, right? The mystery is why don't I have more faith? Well, here's the thing. Thinking more is not going to make you have more faith. Why don't I have more faith? Well, the more you think about it, it's not like that's going to cause you to have more faith. Unless you're reflecting on the word, meditating on the word, because that's right. That's him. That's having faith in him. So what happens is when we're like, why do I not, I, I not have more faith? Well, well, the method for more faith is not staying in the natural and thinking about the natural, right? That's why the Bible says in where, where Apostle Paul says, when I, when, I, when, I, when I came to you, I came not in the wisdom of words, but in the demonstration of power that your faith may, may be in the power of God, comparing uh, spiritual things to spiritual, not, not spiritual things to natural. What does that mean? Natural things are not gonna, natural thinking is not gonna cause you to figure God out. So what is the point? The point is when you spend more time with him, there's a part of you that quietly assimilates into God. There's a part of you that, that quietly disintegrates and integrates. The, let me tell you something. You're not always going to detect when God has integrated into you. There are, there are ways when you're worshiping God, when you're reading his word and you, and your heart shifts to him, where it's not just you fulfilling a duty, where your heart actually shifts to him, where you become thankful, where you remember where, what he actually took you out of. When you start to actually contemplate what he actually did and your heart and your spirit are, are thrusted back into what he took you out of hello and then you read you're reading his word from the place of appreciation from the place of praise from the place of knowing who he is and who you are not let me tell you something you want god to show up agree with him agree with him that is the way to make god show up when you're in agreement and so what happens is when they're when we don't we don't do like david lord show me in my heart what doesn't please you the reason that david did that is because he said if there's something that's not in agreement with god that is the reason i'm not encountering him that is the reason i don't have my answer yet that is the reason i don't have the breakthrough if there's something in me that is not in agreement with him then 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 i can't figure it out I need to go to the source. Let me ask the source what is in disagreement with him, what inside of me is not pleasing him, so that I can come into agreement with him, so that I will I will be able to access him and I will be able to be with him. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. We allow so many distractions to come in our heart. We don't know left from right. We don't know up from down. We don't know what is keeping us from God because we've allowed so many distractions in. We need to be able to go crucify all the things that we feel we need to accomplish let go of all the things that you're chasing because all those things that you're chasing are going to exhaust you it's it's going to exhaust you and, and and cause you to get more distracted from god lay it aside go after him and ask him how to be in agreement with him because the reason that we're not having faith is because he already tore the curtain to the most holy place from top to bottom. He already blew his spirit into you. He gave up his ghost. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. And then he put his, his ghost. It, let me tell you something. I'm saying this and it's convicting me. I want you, I want to be honest and transparent with you. I'm saying these things and it's, it's convicting me. Why? Why? Because there's a lot of times that I am not choosing to access what God has given me. And when I do choose to, and I don't want to get into super detail, but by the grace of God, there are things that I know how to access from God, that I know how to access from God. Because by his grace, and I know it's by his grace, 
he allowed me to go through years when I was still young, right? 23, 24, he allowed me to, to lay down everything. My, I was in college at the time. He allowed me to do those things and just give him all my time. When, when, when in a sense, follow me now, I didn't know better, right? Because when the practical world starts creeping in, the practical world, right? Bills, money, career, it can suffocate the innocence of God. And so by the grace of God, so that, so that, so that I learn, if I, when I give him time, he gives me eternity. So there are ways that, I, that, that I've learned how to access. And I know that when I don't access him, that's when I'm weak. And let me tell you something, and I'm telling you something transparent, and I'm not going to get in, getting in a lot of detail with you. The thing that Satan has always fought in my walk is my access because I know how to find God. How about those that don't know how to find God? The enemy has them where he wants them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because all he fights day and night is me accessing God because by his grace, I learned to. Why? He who is forgiven much loves much. Because I was shattered, broken pieces, and I had no friends and couldn't trust anyone, when he came to me, I held on with everything that I have. And because of that, because of that, I learned, I learned how to, how to, how to, how to, how to come into agreement. But coming into agreement means abandoning everything else. And this is what Christians don't understand. And it's what they don't want to do. And it's like a catch-22 because it requires faith for you to risk being on time somewhere, for you to risk your, your career, for you not to be able to finish your career in two years the way you want to, for you to be able to risk the exact money you want to make, for you to be able to risk the relationships you want, for you to go after God hard again. This is why it's easier when you're younger. And so the enemy manipulates those things so that the way you're going to get more faith is by accessing the most holy place who you carry, but you still have to draw close to God for him. Now, I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying. And here's the thing. It sounds super deep, but, but women, if you're in a relationship and the man is not willing to sacrifice even time at work, let me tell you something. If you know that a man that you're with tells you, I got to work and you know, it's true. I got to work overtime, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, over, overtime, over, I got to work. I got to work. I have to make money. Oh, it's true. We have to make money. We have to make money. After a while, you're not going to care that they have to make money, you're gonna be hurt. That's the way a woman is. So what happens is, how do we give God less? We want access to a God we're not willing to sacrifice things for. But he sacrificed everything already. This is the thing about God. He doesn't tell you to do what he didn't do first. That's the thing about God. God Almighty that is holding the earth together. I don't know if you're hearing what I'm saying. God Almighty that is holding the earth together, that doesn't need to explain himself, that doesn't need to, and yet he doesn't tell you to do what he didn't do first. Isn't that fascinating, right? The Bible says that we love him because he first loved us, right? He gave everything and then he asked you to give everything. He doesn't ask you to give everything without him giving everything. And yet, and yet he's the highest authority. Why should he have to prove to prove anything to us? I don't know if you guys are, that's the beauty of his love. That's the beauty of his love, that, that, that he's willing to, to be the first one to do it. And then he asks us to do it. So what happens is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on Matthew 17, 14, 17, 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is an epileptic and suffer, suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water, water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said to them, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear, I, I bear with you? Bring him up here. This is the thing that happens with, with people in the world and also immature Christians sometimes. This is what happens with us. When he says things like, how long must I be with you or, 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 oh, faithless generation, we feel condemned. We feel like, oh, man, that's it, man. I, I, I suck. That's it. I, I failed. But what you don't understand about Jesus 
is that he's provoking you into the method. He's not condemning you into a state. He's challenging, he's offending you to see if you're hungry for more. When he's offending you, it's provoking you. Do, are you jealous? Because I'm jealous for you. Do you want power? Do you want the supernatural life I predestined you for? Or do you worship your complaints? Some people complain so much, they've made complaining their identity. And God is like, are you going to sacrifice the idol of complaints so that you could at my altar and really walk in the purpose that I, pre I didn't make you to be natural. Listen, this is why we have such a fascination with, 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 with superheroes and Marvel and all these things. It's because we ourselves were not made to be natural. Like there's things that Jesus did that's not even a gift. It's not even one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Like when they, the Bible says the crowd had him on a, on a cliff and they were going to throw him off. And then the Bible says he moved through the crowd. It's like, what? That's not a gift of the Holy Spirit. You move through the crowd. You're on a cliff. Like, 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 like you're Quicksilver, like you're Flash Gordon, like, like, shoo, shoo, shoo. oh, sorry, guys. It's not my time yet. You know what I'm saying? What? So why? Because he had no sin. Understand what I'm saying. What makes us natural is sin. What limits us and makes us powerless, Jesus didn't need to have the gift of Flash Gordon. He didn't have sin, the end. <laughs> You're not hearing what I'm saying. It's sin. We're, we're meant to live forever. Adam and Eve, their bodies had to learn how to die. Their bodies had to learn how to die. We were not made for that. So this is why we're fascinated. God doesn't want you to have a boring natural life. Yet, yet, like we're like like the movie The Matrix, it's in our subconscious. We have paradigms, so we just keep going back to it. We keep going back to the same trouble. We see, we keep going back to the same trials. We keep going back to it because we can't we can't uh, come into agreement with God because the only way that you're going to go to another level of faith is to be intimate with Him. This is what He was telling them when He was saying, "How long do I have to be with you?" It wasn't, man. I already told you that you should have learned. That, that's an aspect, but it isn't just that rudimentary. He was also saying, why are you not taking advantage of me being with you? You want me to prove it to you again? I'll prove this stuff to you. Mary. When Mary, when Mary, hello, broke the alabaster box, the room was filled with the fragrance. He used Mary to rebuke the disciples. Why? Why would you do that? That means that Mary saw something about Jesus the others did not see. That means that Mary took advantage of God being in the form of man in a way his own disciples were not taking advantage of God being in the form of man. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Or, or why would you rebuke them if they didn't have the ability to have the same thing? Why would you correct them? Why would you correct them if that was only made for Mary? If that was only made for Mary, then you shouldn't correct them. Then that's just comparison. And the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. God is not going to compare you to someone else when you have a different gift. It's not about a different gift. It's not about a different gift. It's about why are you not worshiping me like Mary? Don't you understand that if you were worshiping like Mary, who you would be right now? Don't you understand if you were worshiping like Mary, where you would be right now? Don't you understand? That, don't you understand? See, here's the thing about also intimacy with God. Again, I'm getting convicted when I'm saying this. The more intimate we are with him, the more we are, we are automatically, listen to me, without even trying, automatically going to give more Jesus to more people. So when we're not being intimate with him, we're keeping Jesus from people. And I, and I say this with conviction because I've done it. Because I've done it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want to cry right now because... So what happens is the more you have been like Mary and what happened to Mary, what happened to Mary, what happened to Mary is go back a few chapters and try not to cry. Everybody was going to stone her to death. Mary's superpower is that she was completely rejected by the whole town. So she only, so she wasn't going to get acceptance from anyone, but one. That was your superpower. Sometimes we envy people that are popular and famous. 
And you don't know that God is keeping you by not letting you have the same thing because God is jealous for you. Sometimes we, we look at them and we're like, God, but why do you do that with them? And you don't even know. Like Martha, Martha was, had pride. Martha had pride. Martha was saying, man, Mary is wasting time. Like to me, being Hispanic, to me, Martha was like Latina, bro, because that's like a Hispanic thing, bro. Like that's like, that's like everybody has to be working. You know what I mean? Like, like the Bible says that she told Jesus, let her come serve with me. It's like, bro, what? She corrected Jesus. Let her come serve with me. What? The Bible says she told Jesus, let, like, in other words, Jesus is holding her. Let her come serve with me. That's pride. How are you going to correct the Lord? So the Lord told her she has chosen the best part, the part that will not be taken from her. Why did he say that part that will not be taken from her? Because what good is your service and the reward of your service if you lose your soul? In other words, in other words, if you don't, if you're not intimate with me, you're not getting the point and you're just going to have your own religion. You're not even going to have my, a reward for me. So anyways, I'm not going to get, that's a tangent. But what happens is Mary accessed things about Jesus. The disciples didn't. She was the first one that saw him resurrected, by the way. She was the first one that he revealed himself to after he was resurrected. Peter, Peter, James, and John, I'm trying not to cry. Peter, James, and John saw something about Jesus. The other nine didn't. This is why Jesus showed them he was God in the Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't show that to the others. The Bible says he took him aside, and the Bible says he, he became so bright. He became so bright that his face and his, and his clothes started to shine. He was showing them his majesty. Why? There was a hunger the other ones didn't have. Why did they have a hunger? Hunger for God is contingent upon surrender. When we're getting filled with other things, fame, popularity, et cetera, just a little bit, 10%, 15%. That percent is not going to be hunger for God. I don't know if you hear what I'm saying. Oh, you're making those things up. Really? Revelations chapter three. Because you say I have become wealthy and I have no need. And you don't realize you're poor, miserable, wretched, naked, and blind. Come and, 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 chain, and, and uh, repent and trade for your sins. Gold refined through the fire. What? In other words, if my mind state is, Lord, without you, I'm poor, wretched, miserable, and blind. God shows up. It has nothing to do with money. Because you know who did that? King David, who was, who was insanely rich. King David, who was insanely rich, said, I am poor without you. So it has nothing to do with money. It has to do with being poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Is anybody hearing me? So why are we not seeing God? Why are we not encountering God? We're not poor in spirit. We're poor in our mind, not in our spirit. When all we have is complaints, you're poor in your mind, not in your spirit. What does that mean? In your spirit, you're not saying, see, th again, this was Mary's superpower. Mary had no options left. You know why the rich man, why Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Too many options. Too many options. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Too many options. A false sense of security. That was her superpower. Less is more. Where they're looking at those that are famous, but they're still getting filled from the applause of men. They're still getting filled from the pats on the back. They're still getting filled. You're not understanding what I'm saying. The more they keep going back to that, the less hunger they're going to have from God. Before you know it, they're preaching about a God they're not intimate with. I don't know if you, if you guys are hearing what I'm saying. So, so Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is saying, how long must I be with you? Then Jesus answered, oh, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here. And of course, he heals him. What does that mean? Man, that, right? Doesn't that sound harsh? Doesn't that sound harsh, guys? It sounds harsh, right? Like, man, I don't know. I don't know how long. How long do you have to be with me? I don't know. Damn, you know, man, this is messed up, you know? But, but what he's doing is actually saying, here's another thing. I'll give you another example. When the, the Pharisees came to him, when the Pharisees, right, and they were like, of course, they wanted to criticize him about everything. <laughs> she wanted to criticize him about everything. And they were like, how come your disciples, how come your disciples, they don't, they don't fast like everyone else, you know? And then he's crazy, right? He goes, because I, I am with them. When I go, they will fast again, which what does that mean? In other words, because you fast, you fast, listen to me, to get something from God. Sometimes you fast for God himself to be intimate with God. I hope you do that. But what happens is God was eating with them. 
God was talking to them. Why are they going to fast if you have what someone fasts for? It's crazy. Jesus goes to the man born blind and he says, what do you want? I get chills. God is asking you. I don't know why I imagine it's like time stood still. What do you want? To see it's done. And it's crazy. The Bible says, if you hear my words and do them, whatever you pray in my name is given to you. But the thing with us is we confuse, we confuse when with if. We confuse when with if. Are you guys hearing what? In other words, because it hasn't happened yet, we think God said no. No, God is saying when. Because you prayed, you're accumulating something in heaven. Now, now your prayer is, is causing a, a, a God to move things into place so that he could legitimize what he's going to give you. Peter had to go through that situation where he basically backslid for a little minute. He had to go through that. But what he didn't understand is a chapter before Peter did that, Peter wept bitterly. A chapter before, Jesus thanked the Father because he said, all my disciples have kept your word and fulfilled their purpose except Judas. So in his worst moment, Jesus is boasting to the Father about him. Here's another thing. If he would have not denied Jesus, he would have died and not fulfilled the reason why he was named Peter. So God worked his sin into his purpose. So what happens is we're, we don't understand the outcome. Why? We need to be aligning ourselves. When he says, how long must I be with you? What he's saying is, what he was saying is, I am God with you, Emmanuel. Why are you not treating me like God with you? Man, I get the fear of God right now. He is God living inside of me, Emmanuel. Why at times have I not treated him like God living inside of me, Emmanuel? God told the blind man, what do you want? God is telling you, what do you want? But what we want is to be natural. We want God to answer prayers like an Amazon package that we could track. We want to be able to track our, 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 the answer to our prayers like an Amazon package. But here's the thing. If you could track the answer to your prayers like an Amazon package, that wasn't faith. It was emotions. And that means that Satan is going to be, take control of it because Satan lives in the realm of the natural. You want me to prove it? What did Jesus in his confrontation with Satan, what did he tell him? Get behind me, Satan. You're mindful of the matters of men. In other words, you can't understand me because you only understand the needs of flesh. You can't understand that I take pleasure in my death. You don't understand the vision of eternity. All you understand is the moment. You are stuck in time. What happens is flesh is stuck in time. How do I know? Well, didn't I just read to you in Matthew where the Bible says that he, when he was crucified, everybody that was in the tomb came to life? But wait a second. Didn't they live, some of them, a thousand years before? Imagine you, you, you live to be 80 years old, 90 years old, right? And, and, and you die. I don't know, 2000, I don't know, you know, 78, I don't know, right? And, 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 and you die and you go to heaven. And then the great tribulations happens, whatever. And then you come back on earth in your body, chilling. You, you are completely out of your time. What are you doing there? When Moses and Elijah showed up in the mountain, that's not their time. That's like imagine your great, 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 great grandfather coming and saying, hey, I wanted to meet you. Because the men and women of God, since God is the God of eternity, overcome time. What do I mean? Well, boom, they're on earth in Israel. They can go meet their great, 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 great grandchildren. Maybe some of them did. Who knows? Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is the, these are the things of the enemy. He wants you thinking that, you're, that, that this time, 2023, this is it for you. This is it for you. You're stuck 
This, these are, this is the list of problems. You're trapped. You're stuck. Why? Misery loves company. The only ones that are trapped and stuck are called the devil and his demons. That's why the demon, the, the, the demons told Jesus, it's not our time for judgment because they knew judgment is a coming. Judgment is a coming and you are stuck in time and you are going to be judged by Jesus. But us, we're going to live forever with him. So basically what, what, what I'm saying about this is, is our eyes need to open. When the Bible says in Ephesians chapter one, right? Verse 15 to 23. I pray that the spirit of revelation, and I'm going to pray that, that the spirit of revelation come upon you, that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. Let me tell you something. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened is something no one can ever take away from you. Let me tell you something. No angel, and of course, we, we respect men of God, but I'm just going to give you the craziest examples if, if you would allow me to do that. No angel, no apostle, no prophet, no demon will ever be able to take from you what, what when the eyes of your understanding were opened. Right? I'm talking about your spirit, not your third eye. That's demonic. I'm talking about your spirit. When the eyes, Ephesians chapter one, the eyes of your understanding are opened, you, you become one with what you see. What you see becomes a permanent part of you. So when you speak, there's a fire that comes out of you that isn't based on momentary anointing. You want me to prove it to you? The book of Job. Job is complaining in one of the worst states you could be in, super depressed, saying, I wish I was dead. <laughs> like, how, how much worse does it get? He goes, I, I wish I was never born. And then he says, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I got to look again. In the same breath, the same paragraph, right, that he's saying all of this, he starts saying crazy revelation that's not in the other parts of the Bible, where he says, the earth is suspended in midair. And you're like, what? Wait, wait, what? He starts saying crazy revelation. And you're like, whoa, wait, time out, time out, time out, time out. But you're in the flesh. Yes. But there's a part of Job that integrated into God. So even when he's in the flesh complaining, God comes out. <laughs> so what happens is the devil wants to lie to you and make you think that the things that you did in Christ aren't permanent. What you do in God is permanent. What happens is you choose only when you say it's over, can it ever be over? Because what you do in Christ is permanent. Don't you let any preacher, any don't let any demon ever lie to you and make you think that what you did in Christ, your five minutes of prayer, you're still carrying it. The prayers you prayed 20, whatever, 20 months ago, two years ago, you're still carrying it. Let me tell you something. Don't let anybody ever lie to you. The Bible says, I will never forget. What does the word never mean? Does God speak like we speak just to talk like that to impress people at, at the basketball court? Does God do that? He just talks like that like God talks like that? No, 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 no. If he says something, it's because his mind reviewed eternity before he said it. When God says something, his mind reviewed eternity before he said it. Understand that. So when God tells you never, it's because he looked at the beginning of time to the end. He knows what never means. Not even Satan knows what never means. He wishes, he wishes he, he does. So when he says, I will never, listen to what I'm saying, and I want you to remember this. And, and I want, the Bible says, I will never forget the service that you served in my name. I want to cry. I will never forget the service that you served in my name. It doesn't matter if people appreciate you or not, whether they respect you or not whether they promote you or not, whether they honor you or not. Let me tell you something. When you live for the honor of the one, eventually the honor will follow you. But the enemy wants to cut you short. He wants to cut you short. He wants you to think the honor of man is the same thing as the honor of God. He wants you to think that your timing is the same thing as the timing of God. He wants you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? He wants you to think that it, how could it be over if the spirit of forever made a decision before the earth began to live in you? Explain to me, how could it ever be over if the spirit of forever chose to make you his house? We need to wake up people of God. 
And we need to align ourselves to the victory that already happened. You don't got to be out here. You don't got to be out here trying to achieve, achieve victory. Victory already happened. You need to, your eyes, the eyes of your understanding need to be enlightened that your name, listen to what I'm saying now, your name was written on the victory. <laughs> when God chose you and he predestined you, he predestined you according to the victory. The Bible says everything shall pass away. Only the word, only his word, right, shall, shall remain forever. You, your name is written in the word. The Bible says, right? Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's his word. You're not, I don't think, I still don't think you're getting it. If David Rockefeller doesn't repent, or I think he already died, the Rothschilds, the people that are actual trillionaires do not repent, it doesn't matter. They're going to perish. It's going to be over. They're not going to inherit the earth. The funny thing is, I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories, but what, what the, the multi-wealthy, uh, uh, rich are fighting for is to take the earth. It's to take the earth. These things were already written in the Bible. <laughs> God knows who he prepared the earth for. He prepared the earth for you. He put your name in eternity. He put your name on forever. He chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. <laughs> So there's, no, there's nothing that you do for God. We need to open our eyes, allow him to open, pray. We need to pray again. God, open the eyes of my understanding. Because when it's, when it's the eyes of your understanding, when it's your spirit, understand what I'm telling you. When it's your spirit, you know that you know that you know that you know that you know it. That's what the Bible means when it says the righteous are as bold as a lion. You're not as bold as a lion because other Christians are telling you something. That only lasts for a season when you're living off of someone else's altar. You need your own revelation. When, 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 when it's the eyes of your understanding, you could face trials with ferocity because God is not just God. He's your God. And when he's your God, he's your ultimate weapon. There is no weapon. <laughs> and so this happens when he opens the eyes. I don't need someone else's calling. I don't need someone else's favor. I don't need someone else's promotion. You don't know what I have seen. I, the eyes of my understanding ha, have, have been open. When I get with God, it's so personal that I could be in a room of 2,000 people and I know that God is speaking directly to me. I don't need what someone else has. When I'm asleep, I could feel a fire burning inside of me. It's his jealousy. It's his infatuation. It's his love for me. This isn't about a religion or a belief system. This is about a reality and a conviction and an awakening. We need to wake up people of God. This is why Jesus said, how long must I be with you? How long are we going to wait uh, uh, and, and allow natural circumstances to preach a better preaching than the Holy Spirit who's waiting inside of us for us to access him? And I say this, and I say this with, 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 with conviction and excitement, but also with grief, if I could be 100% transparent with you. And the reason I say this with grief also is because I've preached this for years. And very few Christians take this and live it. Christians like the moment, the inspiration. They love it, the inspiration, the moment. Yeah! Right? But then very few of them take it. I know because I'll get calls two, three days later asking for advice about the very thing I preached. Why? Because the Bible says, he who hears my words and does them, I will turn them into a wise man. You don't, you don't need to hear it. You need to see it in your spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't need to just hear it. You need to see it in your spirit. And that's biblical, Third John. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You need to see it. Stop living a motivational, emotional Christianity and start seeing the reality in your spirit. Because when you see the reality, Fire is going to come out of your mouth when you're in, in and out and you were just trying to get a burger. When, 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 you, when you encounter God, God is going to break out of you. We need to stop. See, this is the thing that, that I get grieved. Why? Because you need to get in your prayer room and you need to say, God, open the eyes of my understanding. God, show me what I need to put on this altar. 
God, show me what I need to give up. And cry, cry your, your, your heart out if you need to. Cry your heart out if you need to do it. That's what David did. I do that too, by the way, all the time. Cry your heart out and say, God, show me what I need to change. And if God says, give up Netflix for six months, you give up Netflix. If God says, give up those friends that are cursing, oh, but Lord, they need Jesus and I'm the only one that's going to speak to them. You are not Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stop acting like you are Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stop hanging out with those friends that all they're doing is cursing and smoking. Eventually, you're going to end up doing the same. Bad company corrupts good habits. The word of God does not lie. Oh, but God, they need, they, they need me. They need me. Well, sometimes we're more merciful than God. We're more merciful than God. So, you know, we, we, God is going to tell you, stop watching that stuff because all you're thinking is mother F, F, mother F, because that's what you're watching. Oh, nah, it's because I take it. But Lord, I got the biblical filter. I got the biblical filter though. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I got the biblical filter. And the Lord is like, you're going to have the biblical filthy. You know what I mean? Like, stop it. Well, the Lord is going to say, stop listening to, to, to Bad Bunny. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, you know, you're trying to hop around and be a good bunny, but you're listening to Bad Bunny. You know, like, stop, stop. No, but that's not bad, Lord. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bad Bunny is there making out with guys and girls and everybody, bro. Probably if they throw a bunny he'll, on the stage, he'll make out with a bunny, too. You know what I'm saying? He'll be like that with the bunny and the guy and the girl and everybody. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Social media be wild. Things be popping up on the feed. I'm not trying to watch. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, <laughs> there are things that the Lord is going to tell you, but I understand that the Lord needs to tell you. There are some things that I don't need to tell you. When you choose to let that go for God, he will show up. Isn't it the case? Women, haven't you been in a relationship before that you just feel like the guy is not being completely honest with you? You feel like the guy is just not completely, his heart is not completely in. And because his heart is not completely in, you can't completely give your heart. But yet we want to be like that with the Lord. We want to go to the Lord and be like, yeah, but in two days I'm going to that phone party. Bless me, Lord. We want to be like that with the Lord. And yet we want the Lord to give us somebody that's going to be all about us. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? He's saying, I gave you everything. I put my spirit in you. It's your turn. It's your turn. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, right? I believe it's 2 Corinthians. It says, the, the spirit of a man knows the secret of that man. He has given us his spirit, right? It says, I hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, what it has, nor has it entered the heart of man what God has for those who love him. But we, but, it ha but we have known because he has given us his spirit. But we do know because he's given us his spirit, right? So, I just pray for you guys. I'm going to pray, and I pray because when you have seen God, you become more passionate to see others see God than you do receiving applause. David didn't want their little song. Saul kills his thousands. David kills his ten thousands. He was sad. He was sad. He didn't want the little song. A lot of people, sadly, most people want that little song. He didn't want it. He wanted them to, to wake up. They were in spiritual sleep. He said, you're the armies of the living God, and you're letting an uncircumcised Philistine threaten you. And what does that mean? He doesn't have co a covenant with the all-powerful God. And he's like, you need to wake up. Remember, he taught them a lesson. Today, you're going to learn God doesn't save with sword or with spear. Do you think they learned? They didn't learn. They just wanted a hero. People just want a hero. But God gave us all his Holy Spirit. I know this is a little bit harsh, but it's because I want to see you guys walk in the calling that God has for you. You don't need to be an echo walking in an echo chamber. Church is not supposed to be an echo chamber. It's supposed to be a place where you find your voice and your intimacy with God. And I'm not, I'm not talking about church because I'm talking about we choose what we get in church. You choose. You choose. You choose if you go there for the politics or you choose if you go there for the Lord. Because when you're going there for the Lord, I was in a very political church. The politics didn't affect me. For 16 years, the politics didn't affect me because there was also a lot of God and I enjoyed the God that was there. 
You choose what you receive. Hello? I don't know if you guys are understanding what I'm saying. So I'm going to pray the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. You need to get in your room. You need to say, God, what do I need to give up? I want to see things your way. Because when you're intimate, then you're going to speak to the storm. Hear what I'm saying. A lot of us, and I'm not, this is a whole other topic, and I'm ending. I'm not going to get into a new topic. The reason we're not strong in spiritual warfare is because we don't understand the faithfulness of the one that is backing us up. We have knowledge, but we don't understand in the eyes of our understanding the faithfulness. When you know the faithfulness, what makes you bold, your level of boldness is at the same measure of your understanding of his faithfulness. Your level of boldness is how faithful you think he is. You're not hearing what I'm saying. I'm as bold as I believe. Not think. Anybody, we all think the same. We'll all agree. We all agree. All of us agree. No, what you believe in your heart. What you believe in your heart determines your boldness. That's going to determine how much risk you take for him. And how much risk you take for him is how much power you're going to accumulate. And everybody is going to watch while God is glorified. And so I want you to understand today, you are not condemned. You're not stuck. You're not trapped. It's not over. The best days are coming if you will choose to believe. Because, because the Lord has made you for victory. Do you understand? He just needs you to spend more time with him. Because if you keep listening to other voices, you're going to be led astray. And you're going to fall into the pit again.